February 26th meeting of the Marine Resources <coughs> Commission. Uh, next item on the agenda is public comments. Anyone in the public wish to be heard? Uh, look like they're a happy bunch, so we'll move right along. Uh, license status review number 10. We had gone, gotten down to one license status review. That individual that's in your book contacted his attorney on Thursday. Very late, and his attorney had a conflict today, so it's been continued until the next, uh, next meeting. So we'll move right along. Next item on the agenda is public hearing pertaining to summer flounder. Mr. O'Reilly, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Commissioner and members of the Commission. And this item has taken some changes in the last 24 hours, so we will, uh, you know, provide you those changes. Are we okay um, from, a public, from a public notice perspective? We are okay. okay. Uh, I met with counsel this morning to make sure. So. Uh, I don't know why I ask. That's okay. Um, the, the summer flounder um, fishery is managed jointly by the Mid-Atlantic Council and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, but it's the Mid-Atlantic Council that has the lead. It's the Mid-Atlantic Council that sets the specifications and the Statistical and Scientific Committee sets the ceiling, which you'll see in a minute. In other words, they set as high of a take that can be for summer flounder. And the only thing the council or ASMSC can do is to request something lower, nothing higher. Um, next week, the uh, council and the ASMSC will meet jointly on several issues, but one will be on the information, on some of the information I'm going to uh, present to you. And you can see that this is a proposal pertaining to summer flounder to modify landing dates, possession limits, and landing limits. Uh, for summer flounder that are commercially harvested in federal waters. A little background. Um, we had last year a, we have two periods. We have an early period, which we have now, starting March 1, and uh, started March 1 last year and ended April 30th, and we had a 7,500-pound landing limit. Um, the second period in our fishery was October 16th to December 31st, so that will come before you later in the year. Um, we have a split between the two periods where 60% by regulation is for the first period and 40% is for the second period. And every year the commission sees new proposals, a lot of emergency regulations over time because industry has to seek out the best marketability of summer flounder and that means looking at what other states are doing, looking at the timing of when the fishery is going to occur. Many years it occurred in February, started in February. Um, so lately it has been March. Um, this time around it's March 1 through, um, you know, starting March 1 through April 19th. So it's gonna be a change from what you see on the first line. The other change is we had advertised an 8,500 pound trip limit through our draft regulation. And what council and I talked about this morning was that um, the advertisement, the notice that's in your packet is general. It doesn't specify an amount. So the commission certainly um, has the leeway to go to 10,000 pounds, which is the recommendation. And 10,000 pounds um, is something that on the one hand, if there's any problems with any overage because of the 10,000 pounds, this 60-40 split allows for that. The regulation indicates if you go over the 60%, then it comes off the second period. So everything is fine that way. And the season, again, is at the bottom, March 1 to April 19th. Here's the notice, um, and you can see that it was just a generic type of notice. It didn't specify any poundage. This is what Council and I talked about, and uh, you know, certainly when we do these draft regulations, we have to do them according to 28.2.209 of the Code of Virginia, 15 days in advance of the commission meeting. And there really can't be substantive changes even by the commission. Um, but in this case, with the way the advertisement is, and the fact that it's less restrictive 
to allow industry a 10,000 pound limit compared to 8,500 pounds, that is the reason that we feel that uh, that's certainly allowable. So what happened? Um, with striped bass, which we're not talking about directly, when the new MRIP data, the new Marine Recreational Information Program data, uh, was added to the models, it was first done with striped bass and summer flounder back in November. With striped bass, the new MRIP ended up with a situation where there's an overfished striped bass stock coastwide and overfishing is occurring. With summer flounder, there's not an overfished stock and overfishing is not occurring. And in fact, we started off, you can see at the top, going into 2019 with a 7 million pound coastwide quota. And Virginia has 21 and a few decimal places percent share of that quota. Um, you can see that the quotas are much higher. What the council and ASMSC will vote on next week is whether to accept um, one of these options. You know, right now the staff at the Mid-Atlantic Council, that's not this staff, prefers option one, which would be a variable quota over the three years, but they're not hard and firm on that. But they do think that this will pass through the course. And the course is that the council and the ASMFC have to adopt these specifications, but NOAA has to establish the final rule, which would probably be by May um, in checking today with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Um, so we have a situation where there are more fish available. What the MRIP um, change did was to scale up the spawning stock biomass. So the spawning stock biomass is higher than it was with those changes. And, you know, consequently, the stock is in better shape than previously thought. Um, so if you look at the regulation um, and see the strike throughs, the changes are to have the season change and end April 19th. Um, and industry, again, thinks that economically it's better to have the 10,000 pound limit now um, rather than the competition that might be faced in the fall from other states. And then in, in item two, you can see that the possession limit changes to 10,000 pounds um, compared to last year at 7,500. Um, so our recommendation is <coughs> to amend Chapter 4 of VAC 26-2010 in sequence pertain to summer flounder to modify the landing dates, March 1 to April 19th, the possession and landing limit of 10,000 pounds per trip for summer flounder commercially harvested offshore. Um, and that's in federal waters. And just as a reminder, since 2002, we've had a companion system with North Carolina. A lot of the vessels have, uh, you know, permits in both states. So we allow North Carolina fish on our vessel, but only the Virginia fish can be offloaded, and then the vessel has to steam down to the North Carolina part, the port and offload as well. And a year and a half ago, New Jersey was added to that. So at certain times, there could be more, more infrequently, definitely the North Carolina, New Jersey quota on a vessel. And uh, you know that was the most recent change. Uh, there's a lot going on with summer flounder. Uh, we'll see how this goes forward next week. One item next week is the three and a half year old commercial amendment may or may not come to a conclusion. And this big item is the um, looking at the original 1980 to 89 allocations with a desire by New York especially, but some other northern states to shift those allocations and take away some allocation from Virginia, North Carolina, and Rhode Island as the top three states. Um, that's been dragging along, and we'll see what happens next week. So uh, thank you very much. Any questions for Rob? Great briefing, Rob. Thank okay. you. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Anyone in the public wish to be heard on this matter, pro or con? They're seeing none. The matter's before the commission for action. Motion, Ms. Reiner? 
for the approved staff recommendations. Motion made by Mr. Miner to approve staff recommendations. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Neal. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, thank you, everyone. You, sir. Okay, thank you. Next item is item 12, request for March public hearing to incorporate additional amendments pertaining to the Channel Well pot fishery. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner and members of the Commission. Last month, staff requested a March public hearing on changing the culling ring for minimum shell width of channeled whelk. Upon further research and discussion with the VMRC Regulatory Review Committee, staff proposes to amend our request to advertise for a March public hearing. Staff has included in our request for public hearing an option to remove the culling ring, as seen here, for minimum shell width and only regulate channeled whelk by minimum shell length. This will increase consistency of measurement for culling by law enforcement as the culling ring can be manipulated to allow legal whelk, legal sized whelk to pass through. That's what you see here, that is a legal whelk, but due to the asymmetrical uh, shell, it can be turned and can fit through the culling ring. Uh, any channeled well shells with broken tips would need to be at least the five and a half inches or would need to fall within the sublegal tolerance of 10 shells per unit of measure. Um, on such, our next request is to advertise for a modification to the container used in culling for the 10 sublegal whelk tolerance. Staff recommends the use of a standard orange basket as is currently done in the oyster fishery instead of by bushel or by barrel, as is currently in regulation. Law enforcement has expressed concerns to staff that the metal bushel tub is cumbersome and as such is not often carried with them in their enforcement duties. Uh, the orange baskets are lighter, cheaper, and more likely to be with the law enforcement officer or on a vessel when they are culling harvest. Uh, law enforcement also requested defining a culling procedure in regulation, uh, also similar to as is currently in the oyster regulations. Our last request is to explicitly allow for harvest of any species of the Busaconidae family of whelks, which includes knobbed whelks in channeled whelk pots. So the staff recommendation is to advertise for a March public hearing on amending Chapter 4, VAC 289010 pertaining to channeled whelk to amend or remove the minimum shell width as measured by culling ring, define the undersized tolerance by basket replacing the bushel and barrel, define the procedure by which law enforcement can select channeled whelk to be culled, and explicitly allow the possession of knobbed whelk and other whelk species in channeled whelk pots. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. The matters before the commission. What's the pleasure of the commission? Mr. Tankard? I'm, I move to approve a public hearing in March related to this matter. Is there a sec second by Mr. Minor? Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next item request to postpone February 2019 public hearing on towing fish until the March meeting of the commission. Mr. Gillingham. Commissioner and associate commissioners, good afternoon. <clears throat> I hope you had a moment to step outside. This is a be beautiful place, and this is probably one of the nicest days we've had. Since We're hoping we for that real fast. I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. Trust me. <laughs> That's the thing. You got me. Good job, Lewis. Thank you. I, we rehearsed that, right? <laughs> There it is. Okay. Yes, this is a request for a postponement of today's public hearing. Uh, the request to po postpone the February public hearing for the day, uh, 4 VAC 20 740 10, on the advice of the Regulatory Review Committee. I could say they were on the top of their game February 7th when they, <coughs> when they met. Members of the Regulatory Review Committee, Deputy Commissioner Bowen, 
and Captain Green both proposed to extend the scope of the prohibition of towing to any fish with an established possession limit. <clears throat> the rationale is the inclusion of all species of regulated fish with a possession limit will asset, assist in curtailing the practice of high grading, which is substituting a larger fish for a smaller fish already in your possession. <clears throat> Background. The regulatory review panel was established in 2009 by Commissioner Bowman on his first tour of duty here. Uh, the panel generally meets four days prior to filing of the official public hearing regulations that are due 15 days prior to the commission meeting. The postponement will allow staff to re-advertise 4VAC 20-740-10 with a bro broader scope recommended by the review committee. Staff believes a one-month delay will have no impact as striped bass season closed on December 31st and cobia season is currently slated to open June 1st. If approved, the public hearing will be re-advertised and scheduled for a public hearing March 26th. Last night, uh, FMAC met. They seemed okay with the delay, and they continue uniformly to support the idea of eliminating the towing of fish. We did have one member of the public, Captain uh, Mike Avery, who's also chairman of the Virginia Saltwater Sport Fishing Association, gave us results of his preliminary studies being uh, conducting on his on a uh, uh, a public oops yes whether the public supports or does not support elimination of the towing of striped bass and cobia which is the way it was initially advertised and 76 percent of the 206 people that have replied so far are in favor of eliminating that. So I'm sure he'll be here at the public hearing next month and give you an update on that. Um, I gotta keep my hand off of this thing, it's dangerous. Um, staff recommendation, re-advertise 4VAC 20-740-10 for a March public hearing such that Towing of fish means securing to any harvested and possessed fin fish species regulated by a possession limit that has been placed in the water when the engine of the vessel is running and in gear. Additionally, it will be unlawful for any person to tow any species of fin fish regulated by a possession limit. Any questions by members of the commission? Dr. Neal? Yes. I understand law enforcement's desire to go to uh, all, all species, all right, but uh, we catch small bluefish, bridle them up, troll them, if we catch king mackerel. You can do the same thing with Spanish mackerel. Those are species that are regulated, and so would be uh, slow trolling a live bluefish be considered towing. Thankfully, I'm not law enforcement. Okay. So um, that, that I guess, I guess of, my statement with but, that is is that, that fish are used for bait. Right, live right? fish. And, and, and live fish are used for bait, and we do slow troll live fish. And so between now and next month, uh, that should be thought about. Okay. And, and, and in fact, FMAC at their January meeting brought up several exceptions, and I know of another one, a big tuna that a Two guys in a smaller private boat could not get in the boat. They lashed it to the side and essentially towed it. Had one angler say, well, you know, we tow a shark to kill it. Or another angler said, well, we actually tow a red drum with one of those release clips in its mouth to try to resuscitate him in a better manner. So, I mean, there are those types of exemption situations that I'm, I'm hoping the public will be here and we'll talk about and FMAC will meet again before this public hearing and we could perhaps hear something at that time. I think if I may, part of the concern there is most, most but not all species that have a possession limit have a legal minimum size limit as well. So it could be that that's added to this situation that you may not tow 
any fish that are covered by a possession limit as long as they um, are a minimum legal size so that your bait fish would be less than the legal minimum size for in most, most cases in most, most cases Only, yeah. so then the exception is Spanish man. so we can't get it all yeah. <laughs> probably but if that would help um, you know that's something that would to take care about. of the bluefish but yeah. the, the Spanish would still a, yeah. you know, a 14 inch Spanish a big king loves eating them things right. Just well, <laughs> I'm pleased to say that the law enforcement division we have here are pretty professional, yes. very professional, <laughs> and exercise very good discretion. So I think we probably can work that yep. out and into the program by virtue of uh, Colonel Otterman and Yep. So that, that's Colonel my only point. That, that should be thought of, yep. thought yep. about. And that's what the public hearing's about. That's one of the things. As a former law enforcement officer, they know what kind of summons is to write and what not to write, and definitely what not to write. Yeah, well, I, I've been very impressed with you, Marcy. I've been uh, your law enforcement <laughs> officer. I've been Thank very you. well acquainted with him this month. <laughs> <laughs> Something you need to t never mind. Um, <laughs> he meant that in a good way. I know. <laughs> What's the pleasure of the commission? Uh, to approve staff's request to delay this hearing for a month. Second. Motion made by Dr. Neal, seconded by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Lewis. Next aye. item, 14, request for the approval of 2019 Oyster Replenishment and Restoration Plan and Associate Procurement Procedures. Uh, yes, she is. I just make sure the person that handles the money is here. So. I'm Andrew, good afternoon, sir. I'm afraid to X that out. All right. I might lose. I think, I think I'll be good there. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Let's see. Maybe you hit escape. Well, I think this should go out and no, just pull it up there. That's what I was afraid there. to do. No, we'll, we'll, we'll pull it up. There we go. So this is actually a, um, on a historic note, going through the process of uh, cleaning out various boxes, came across some old uh, reports from the Fisheries Commission there from back in 1928 and 29, and uh, that was actually the first year that oyster replenishment got its start. So this 2019 season will be uh, 90 years of uh, oyster replenishment for, uh, for the state here. So That's it's cool. sort of our little uh, historic note for, for folks there. Um, that being said, this is the request for the approval of the 2019 Oyster Replenishment Restoration Plan and Associated Procurement Procedures. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with a little bit of an update on, on, on the current level of oyster harvest. This is through the 2017-2018 season, so this does not include this year. Um, you'll see that actually we rebounded slightly from the last season. We were kind of up there on the public and private ground harvest for uh, um, since compared to the 2016 2017 season. This was sort of anticipated based on recruitment from previous calendar years. So that was actually good news that we've sort of been relatively stable, but a slight increase after dropping down a little bit there in the, the previous season. Um, <clears throat> this is a, just what the public harvest looked like there. And you can see for two years it was down slightly, but relatively stable. Um, the level of effort in the fishery is relatively stable in the, and uh, sort of with the current management strategies that we have, the real driving factor is going to be continued replenishment effort and spat sets, but if we can maintain this level and sort of just keep these ups and downs going, we'd be in, in relatively good standing there. Um, again, this is private oyster production. You can see it follows along closely with the public production. Um, private ground production is still, in many cases, linked to actual natural productivity. Um, natural spat sets. So they tend to largely track together. <clears throat> um, so I mentioned there that uh, um, that uptick was anticipated and that was primarily a result of, of good spat sets in 2015 and 2016. Um, this is sort of a, a broad bay-wide picture that you're looking at. Um, so basically this is the number of shells on the bottom which is part of what the replenishment does and this is the number of spat per square meter. So the higher this number is in 2016, generally, unless there's an event such as freshwater mortality, two or three years <coughs> later, you're going to see that area have more market oysters on the bottom. Um, this was 2017, so a little bit lower than it has been um, sort of in 2016 and 2015, which is what 
those harvest numbers I showed you were working off of. So we'd anticipate a little bit of a decrease in, in the coming seasons based on this bat set. And um, JJ there at the with the with the presentation on SAV went over the fresh water that had it be experienced this year. And this is what the 2018 spat set looks like. Um, again, this scale on the side is is the number of spat per square meter. And what we saw primarily as a result of all that fresh water mortality is spat sets weren't nearly as good as they have been in recent years and in some areas almost non-existent. Um, so that's one of those things that in future years, not this next season more likely, but in two or three years from now, um, the harvest, the market oysters not, might not be at the levels that they have been and we would probably see in many areas a little bit of a decrease in multiple years if this wet weather continues. Um, there would be potential for, I mean, if there's no spat there, once you've harvested the market oysters from that area, if there's nothing coming behind them, um, you know, your, your harvest could go down a little bit. The good news is this wasn't in all areas the case. There are a few areas um, that got replenishment efforts this last year that did receive extremely high spat sets. One of those areas was the Lower James River. So in this area, there were in excess of 1,000 spat per square meter on some cases where we did put shell. So this stresses the importance of continuing the replenishment restoration work so that there is shell on the bottom when the spat are there. And really sort of the key things to look at are this five and 10 liter line there. That's what we like to, the minimum threshold that we like to keep those areas in. And that basically just means there's enough shell on the bottom that if a good spat set occurs, there's enough shell for actually literally room for the spat to set on. So that's what we try to maintain our public harvest areas is that minimum of five and ideally above 10. So that's really the whole point of most of the replenishment of public grounds is to keep that shell base there and waiting um, when we do get a spat set so we can capitalize on it. So that's just a little overall background there. <coughs> um, so I'll go over the, the funding sources here of uh, um, <coughs> this year's replenishment plan. So <coughs> we had consistently gotten $2 million of general funds um, since 20, uh, 2014 was the year that we consistently got those $2 million of general funds. In 2007, the Blue River Oyster Panel recommended $2.5 million of oyster restoration in general funds. And I'm happy to say that this is the first year we actually have $2.5 million in replenishment specific general funds. Um, uh, the previous budget um, before this last request, um, our budget was increased for both replenishment and restoration. So you might notice there's a distinction being made this year. Um, so there was a budget increase of $750,000 last year that was for restoration specific funding. So um, the current administration took that to mean non-harvest areas. So restoration funding will be work done on areas that are closed to harvest. Um, and this year actually just, just came through the, the final budget process there that we did get an additional million dollars of general funding that will be split 50-50, uh, I believe, between restoration and replenishment funding, bringing the general funds available to $2.5 million in general funds for replenishment work on harvest areas, and $1.5 million in this current coming fiscal year, starting July 1st, I guess, or $1.5 million in restoration areas. The other funding sources are we have a long-standing relationship with the Nature Conservancy where they provide grant funding for certain restoration and replenishment projects. In some cases, they have helped assist uh, um, harvest area uh, replenishment efforts on the seaside in certain areas. Um, and also non-general funds, primarily the funds gathered by the oyster resource user fee annually. And in addition to these non Yes, ma'am. I just got a question clarification. Just, so this is for 2019 work, so FY20 funds, correct, for the state funds? Funds. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, <clears throat> and also, uh, we've currently pursued some federal funding sources. Um, there's, we have uh, a high likelihood of getting a, a federal grant for around $570,000 or so from NOAA for restoration specific work. Um, and we have the uh, an grant application in for um, additional NOAA funding that could be upwards of a million dollars, depending on the level of funding. We're not sure yet on that. The process did get slightly delayed due to the um, 
the uh, government shutdown there, but we'll, we'll be tracking through that. And if we do get these funds, I've included um, in this plan uh, where we'd like to spend those so that we're ready to go have a plan and can and utilize those funds if, if, that, if they become available this year. <clears throat> um, so that's where the, where the money is coming from, and, and then we'll roll right now into the actual where, well, where we will be spending this money. So the first portion of the plan is um, the transplant of seed oysters. So in previous years, we've primarily moved seed oysters from the upper James River Hantong areas. Uh, this was included as part of the plan last year to move about 5,000 bushels to one of the Potomac tributaries. Um, as part of that plan, we were going to institute a rotational management strategy in the Potomac tributaries to basically close the areas that had just received seed plants for a number of years before, usually three years, to allow more market oysters to, to come to size to sort of better use those funds. Um, we put out a notice last year to advertise to move these seed oysters at $10 a bushel, and we received no responses to that. So we took sort of a different approach, and it just so happened that that year we had uh, replenished an area in the lower James River with fossil shells that received an extremely high spat set, and we were able to catch by dredge some of those oysters from that area and move those at a substantially lower cost and still complete that portion of uh, the replenishment plan. Um, at around six to seven dollars a bushel, and we replanted that area again this year. And this is one of those areas that I mentioned that received an extremely high um, set of oysters. That was actually that picture there that I showed you uh, um, in the beginning. Those were actually fossil shells that we planted this last summer that received that high set. And we'd like to move this seed to a number of different areas. A second tributary in the Potomac, the Yakamico, um, an area in the Upper Rappahannock, Radico Bar. Um, and then an area in the P Pocomoke Sound, um, and these are the levels that we anticipate being able to take from this area. And this would be areas that didn't have the spat set that we got in these areas this year, so these areas that had lower spat sets or traditionally have lower spat sets, and this would be a way of sort of sharing that wealth of the lower James River spat set that we got that, this year. So when these areas do come into harvest in future years, um, the impact of this year won't be quite as substantial as it would be if we didn't move this seed to those areas. Um, so it would be 5,000 bushels to Yukamico, 10,000 bushels Rappahannock, and then 10,000 bushels to an area um, in the upper Pocomoke Sound. Um, this is the standing stock of the seed areas in the James River, and you can see actually partially related to that freshwater mortality, as well as uh, increased seed effort that we've discussed at previous meetings. These areas have seen their standing stocks start to come down a little bit, and this is another benefit of moving this seed from the lower river areas. We won't be putting additional pressure on some of these areas in the upper James that have seen their standing stocks start to come down with the increased seed harvest as well as this year's, this past year's freshwater mortality. So this is just the number of smalls in those areas. And this is where the bigger drop is in the number of market oysters in these upriver areas. So a lot of the freshwater mortality um, affected some of the larger sized oysters in these areas, as well as um, you know these areas are harvested every year and some of the seed movement, they might target areas that have a particularly high level of market oysters because they can then be um, reharvested sooner than if you're just getting the smaller seed oysters. So basically by moving this fossil shell from the lower areas, there's a picture of it, we'll be taking that added pressure off of these areas. So you can see there's actually spat on top of spat on top of spat there, um, which is good news. <clears throat> so not all bad news with that freshwater mortality. These areas in the Yukamico that we plant, um, Maratico Bar, in Area 8 right here, and this is known as sort of Shell Rock or Area 13 in sort of the lower Pocomoke River, upper Pocomoke Sound there that we get that seed. Um, in past years, we have done a uh, um, sort of a seed trade in the Great Wacomico and Piankatank Rivers where private industry has been allowed to harvest seed oysters and then replant two bushels of shell for every bushel harvested. We don't anticipate offering this program this year. These areas didn't have the spat set to support that. And it's unlikely that if we did offer the program, private industry would be interested because the counts per bushel are generally too low um, to make it worth their while. So we might lightly replenish these areas just to sort of maintain them, but we wouldn't offer this as an option to private industry this year, primarily due to that lower than anticipated spat set in these areas. Um, which brings us to uh, the, a little bit of the, the meat there of uh, the shell plant where we'll be spending the majority of the replenishment dollars. 
is on shell planting. Um, so the areas that we'd like to focus on this year would be the Tangier Pocomoke Sound, um, Blackberry Hangs, Rappahannock River, Piankatank River, Mobjack Bay, York River, and the Lower James River. Um, in total, 586 acres. There are <clears throat> close to 658 acres right now that are below that five liter threshold. Um, but these are the areas that have either just been opened to harvest or have sort of the um, greatest likelihood of success or the consistent spat sets um, and that we'd likely be able to be in the area and sort of have the, the most impact with the amount of shells we can afford to put on the bottom this year. And I'll run through just where those areas are really relatively quickly here. <clears throat> um, and this is just a snapshot if there's any questions about a specific area, I have extra slides, but this is sort of generally what you see in most areas. Um, actually, this is a, a little bit of anomaly here. This is one of the areas in Tangier, Pocomoke Sound that did get a higher spat set this year on those fossil shells. So not a lot of areas look like this. I'll show you some other slides there, but Tangier Sound was one of the areas um, that did get a little bit higher spat set. So that was good news. That's the, the blue line on the bottom there. Um, these are the areas in Tangier Sound that we'd like to work on. Um, public Ground 7 or the Thoroughfare and California Rock or Public Ground 8, these areas were open to harvest this year so they would get a year of rest after um, replenishment, um, hopefully catch another set this year and then have some time to get up to size before they're open to harvest. Um, <clears throat> so this is what we saw in most other harvest areas. As you can see, this blue line or blue portion of the graph here is actually a good spat set and then talked about in 2015 um, and you can see that sort of, this is area two that'll be open next year to harvest, that the spat sets for sort of two consecutive years haven't been as good as we'd like them to be. Um, this gray area here is the number of market oysters, which when they're open up to harvest will be, you know, about as good as they were the last time it was opened up. But once those areas, the gear types that we use are efficient enough that once those areas have been open to harvest, if there's not a good spat set behind them, um, then when they come back onto rotation, that well, those market oysters won't be there. So the gear types that we use are efficient enough that the majority of easily caught market oysters are taken every year. So if there's no spat set two, three years later, the number of markets hasn't recovered yet. So next year we should be okay, but in subsequent years, um, if we don't get good spat sets, we, should, we may start to see that decline in the number of market oysters there. But the areas that we'd like to focus on this year are the areas that were open to harvest um, just recently. So area five here and area three in the lower Rappahannock, about 56 acres there. <clears throat> um, this is the Temple Bay area, a little closer shot, and um, Parrot's Rock area here below the bridge. Um, the York River is another area, and again, you can see that spat set there in 2015, very high, and 2018, um, substantially lower. So again, number of markets here is not quite as high as they were right there when it was last open to harvest, but has started to recover we're still working on a, a better spat set in previous years. So again, this area will be open. Um, it should be okay this coming season, but in future years, if we don't get a spat set, you know, you could see those harvests sort of start to come down in those areas. But the areas that we'd work on replenishing are uh, Pages, Aberdeen, and Timberneck here. Um, <clears throat> here's a closer view. These areas, Timberneck would be uh, the area coming into rotation next year. We'd probably go ahead and put some shell there since we're gonna be in the area and it'll need it. Um, but we'd also replenish the, the upper areas as well. Um, there was also some discussion about mob jack at the SMAC meeting. So we do in plan on replenishing this area. This is the area that was open to harvest this year. Um, there was some concern um, expressed by some SMAC members about potential poaching causing some issues here. Um, I know law enforcement's been active in this area and it's one of those, do you let an area go because you think there's a problem or do you replenish it and count on uh, the good work of our Virginia Marine Police to, to enforce the area? And there was just some discussion in SMAC about that and these are areas that are historically productive and generally do get a good spat set. Um, so we'd like to go ahead and, and replenish them this year um, as well as Browns Bay here in the lower portion of the mob jack. <coughs> Um, the James River has one of the, 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 it did get some extra effort this year, but it also has got consistent replenishment. It's closest to uh, the shell deposits that we work with every year. So most of the hand scrape areas in Lower James get consistent replenishment every year. And despite being not in a rotation, this area 
has still been doing well. It did have some added pressure this year, so we're going to take a good look at it um, in a spring resurvey. But you can see the number of markets has been pretty consistent and the number of smalls as well. I didn't include the SPAT set on this graph because it would really kind of throw things off there a little bit because it was actually um, so much higher than many of the other areas there. So these areas, even the harvest areas, you know, were very good in terms of the number of SPAT that we were seeing there. So a lot of culling for the harvesters, but that means that there's a future in coming years there. And these are the areas that would be replenished there, uh, um, Lower Brown Shoals, Bollard's Marsh, Upper Dog. Um, Nansman Ridge is the area where we planted that fossil shell that we'd be moving for um, the seed program this year. <clears throat> so that's the areas that would be replenished. And just sort of as a, um, for the information of the commission there, this is the Deep Rock Patentong area standing stock. And this is an area that has received minimal replenishment effort, but this orange area here is again the number of markets, and this is an area that's a different gear type, has received minimal replenishment effort, um, and has had increasing pressure on it. Um, this year, upwards of 30 boats for the first times, but the standing stock has continuously improved in this in this area, and it's one of the the, the areas that has sort of uh, helped keep this oyster season going this year with some of the fresh water mortality and the disappointment that was in, in the Rappahannock. So this is one of the areas that's been, been holding up this season is this Patentong area here. So we'll take a good look at it, see what that additional effort might have been the impact to, but generally this area with minimum replenishment effort has been holding its own compared to some of the hand scrape areas. Um, so that's the uh, shell planting portion on the bay side. We'd also generally do a, a smaller seaside shell planting program. Um, with a combination of general funds as well as TNC funding. So we'd like to do that again this year. Um, some of those areas that were shown on, the, on JJ's presentation around South, South Bay have had oyster replenishment work in the past, and he didn't get to mention it. But I'd like to think our oysters there probably helped out a little bit with the water clarity there. But uh, we'd like to continue that program there on the seaside as well. Um, so that's approximately 11 acres and 10,000 bushels of an acre um, there on the seaside. Um, this is a, a, a portion of the replenishment plan that's continued to expand with uh, some of our expanded restoration funding. Um, so in previous years, we've experimented on a smaller scale with alternative substrate, primarily crushed stone or uh, concrete. We've done that in some harvest areas as well as some sanctuary areas. Uh, <clears throat> right now, we have some existing permit locations. These are the Chesapeake Bay Deep Rock area. Um, areas in the Rappahannock, the James River, um, as well as the Pocomoke Sound. Um, <clears throat> I'll go over the Pocomoke Sound project. This was a project that was part of last year's replenishment plan, and the permitting process, as well as some of the funding, was delayed for this project, so only a portion of it was completed. But the plan called for these areas shown in yellow here being um, cleaned of live oysters and shell. There were some poaching concerns in the areas and then being replanted sort of on the, the best parts of the oyster rock, just in sort of a thin strip there with larger size stone to create sort of a poaching resistant sanctuary area that would provide brood stock for some of the replenishment effort that's been ongoing in this area. So last year we did plant some shells in areas nine and 10 of the upper Pocomoke um, after moving the shells further away from the Maryland line. Um, and now we have the existing permits in place to do the stone portion of this, and we'd probably do that on sort of a, a test scale there, um, using restoration funding, probably sort of the, the large scale, the largest size of that project would be sort of that three hundred to five hundred thousand dollar range. There would be an opportunity to potentially partner with other restoration folks, such as um, TNC or potentially CBF. There in these areas, there's been some discussion about that. Um, but that's sort of the, the idea now, at least on a test basis, start there. Um, the majority of the stone planting uh, as part of the 2014 Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. Uh, several tributaries in Virginia, five to be exact, were selected for large-scale oyster restoration. Um, they're the Great Wicomico, the Piankatank, the York, the Lynn Haven, the Lafayette. Um, the Piankatank is an area that we'd like to focus on as part of that agreement with restoration funding. So these are areas that we're seeking additional permits for to the ones that are existing um, for additional stone planting in the Piankatank um, <coughs> there. Uh, 
this is the area that we also have a federal <coughs> grant application for in the Lynn Haven River for alternative substrate planting. Um, we've carefully selected these areas to be adjacent to state-owned marsh, and these areas would be planted in a similar manner to those areas on the seaside where we do primarily an intertidal to shallow subtidal planting, and this would be a combination of stone and potentially some shell in some areas. And we selected these areas to sort of minimize user conflicts, so the areas would be, as I said, in that sort of shallow area that wouldn't cause any impact to navigation and adjacent to state-owned marsh, and would also work towards that Chesapeake Bay agreement of restoring these tributaries um, that the state is a signatory on. So that would be the plan there for Lynn Haven. Um, and that concludes the replenishment and restoration plan for this year, and staff does recommend the approval of the 2019 Oyster Replenishment and Restoration <coughs> Plan, as well as the associated procurement procedures. I'd be glad to take any questions um, at this point. Sure. Questions from members of the commission? Just Is a there? quick question. What's your timeline on the Lynn Haven work? Um, it is somewhat contingent on permitting conditions there, so there is a little bit of a review process for alternative substrate um, that goes back and forth with the Corps as well as NOAA, uh, but we'd anticipate being able to begin that work in June, and we could probably finish it by, I would say, the end of August into September at the latest. And how many acres? That's going to be approximately 10 acres, um, so probably in the 10 to 13 acre range, I would say. Thank you. Further questions? Very good briefing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't uh, this. This is the first time in a few years that I've done the procurement on this. We just basically uh, approve staff recommendations as outlined, or was there a separate something that we used to have to do? The I'm sorry? There, your, your attachment there is the procurement procedures. Um, so those are the approval of the procurement activity sort of outlined there in that, that first attachment there. So. <clears throat> okay, first item on the, uh, we need to take up is the, uh, for the commission is the approval of the plan. Um, the chair will entertain a motion. I move to approve the 2019 oyster replenishment and restoration plan. Motion made by Mr. Tankard, seconded by Ms. Everett. Further discussion on approval of the plan? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The next item is the approval of the procurement activity for the 2019 oyster replenishment program as outlined in your attachment. The chair will entertain a motion. I Mr. Tanker. I move to approve the procurement activity for the 2019 oyster replenishment program. Motion Second. made by Mr. Tankard, second by Mr. Zedrin and Mr. <laughs> Mr. Minor. Anyway. Uh, Mr. Zedrin. I'll any further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Get to work. All right. All right. <laughs> Deal. Next item is item 15 for discussion uh, pertaining to Tile Fish and Grouper. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Commissioner and members of the Commission. All right, so good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. If you don't recognize me, uh, my name is Ethan Simpson. I'm one of the new fishery planners here with the um, commission. Um, I'm here today to discuss the mandatory recreational reporting requirements for our various recreational fisheries. Um, so particularly, we are here to discuss amendments, potential amendments to the tilefish and grouper regulations to remove the permitting and mandatory recreational reporting requirements for that fishery and to amend the regulations for the amberjack, cobia, and striped bass regulations to extend the deadline for reporting. And I don't even have my slide up. Okay, so um, I would like to start with the history of this program here. Um, it was initiated in 1995 with the striped bass fishery. 
Uh, but it wasn't until 2015 that the current permitting system and reporting requirements were instituted. Um, this included the stipulation that an angler is ineligible for the next year's permit if they fail to report. Uh, Tilefish and Grouper were added to the program in 2009 as a way for VMRC to fill data gaps and show not only that there was harvest for these species, but also that the VMRC was capable of monitoring and managing these fisheries. Um, also, we know that the Commission approved a voluntary permitting and reporting program for the 2016 recreational cobia fishery. This became mandatory in 2017. Um, also in 2017, the reporting requirements became uniform for each of these species, including the stipulation that no fishing effort must be reported. So staff has recently heard some concerns over the current reporting rates of these recreational species. Um, the reporting rates outlined in this table include only the reports submitted by the 15-day deadline at the end of each season. Um, for the past two years, the Commission has allowed an informal uh, waiver, more or less, on the deadline requirement, meaning that staff have been taking reports <coughs> beyond that deadline and anglers have been allowed to remain eligible for next year's permit. Um, at this point, however, the requirements and there have been in the regulations for at least two years in the case of cobia, longer for the case of uh, striped bass, and staff believes that a stricter adherence to the requirement would improve reporting rates moving forward. Um, we did get some feedback from FMAC meeting last night, uh, both from the committee, which felt that a 15-day deadline may not be enough time for English to report, but also from the public, which felt that any longer than a month, um, you run the risk of introducing bias into your data set and just from memory loss or failure to report um, intentionally. So looking at the table, it, it is immediately apparent that reporting rates for the tilefish grouper <coughs> fishery are low, um, and there is also a very clear increase in the cobia reporting from 2016 to 2017. In the case of the cobia, that was due to the fact that, as I mentioned, the 2016 was on a voluntary basis, and 2017 it became mandatory. Um, Overall, the new reporting requirements in 2017 did clearly improve the reporting rates for tilefish grouper and cobia, although for the tilefish grouper, the rates have since remained low. Um, we would like to specifically look at those tilefish grouper reporting rates, and as you can see, they have been consistently low for this fishery, even after the implementation of those 2017 uh, mandatory no effort reporting. Um, in fact, for the last two years, we've just averaged 23.5% reporting rate for that fishery. To go over the regulations, just to summarize, uh, currently captains and operators of recreational vessels must obtain a recreational tilefish and grouper permit with the captain or operator being responsible for reporting for all anglers aboard. Similarly, any individual fishing from a shore, pier, or other structure for tilefish or grouper must also get the permit and adhere to the same reporting requirements. Uh, concerning Reporting requirements, specifically permittees must permit report any trips where tilefish or grouper were targeted, whether any were caught or not, by the 15th day after the close of the tilefish grouper recreational fishery seasons. Uh, permittees must also notify the commission of their lack of participation by the same 15-day deadline. And finally, those who fail to report entirely are ineligible to receive the permit for the following year. Um, currently, the commission has allowed that waiver period, but the online system, it should be noted, does not allow a angler to re-up that permit unless they report. So they'll have to call us in before the computer will allow it to be renewed. <coughs> um, some other considerations just regarding the tilefish grouper fishery. Um, the, besides the low reporting rates, this is a federal fishery. Therefore, anglers are required to report the catch to NOAA's VTR program. And they've also added the new EVTR program, which has made it easier. Um, but this does resort in double, double reporting. Um, on that same kind of line of thought, staff time is currently spent processing and answering questions about the requirements, but the program does not produce any unique data from NOAA's BTR program. Um, and due to the questionable nature of the data and the low reporting rates, none of this data has been used by the staff to inform any management decisions thus far. Um, I do want to point out, though, that that was just for Tilefish Grouper. In terms of Kobe and Striped Bass, um, we do use that data. The reporting data for both of these fisheries is used to aid stock assessment efforts. Specifically, cobia weight data was used by ASFMC during their development of the cobia management plan, and the striped, das, striped bass data has been regularly used to inform the overall stock assessments. So for now, staff recommends the commission advertise for a March public hearing to firstly amend Chapter 4 VAC 20-1120 pertaining to Talfish and Grouper <coughs> to remove the permitting and mandatory reporting requirements, 
and to two, amend chapter four VAC 20-510 pertaining to Amberjack and Cobia, and chapter four VAC 20-252 pertaining to the taking of striped bass to adjust the mandatory reporting deadline from 15 days to 21 days after the season closure and to add compliance language, which includes the failure to report any one year will result in loss of eligibility for that permit the following year. And to make it clear that it's just for that following year that you're ineligible and you may reapply in subsequent years. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Any or questions by members of the commission? Any input would also be appreciated. Uh, Dr. Neal? All right, just a couple, couple of things. The VTR, federal VTR system, that's for higher vessels. Correct. So that doesn't apply to me. So, that, so you would lose my reporting because I don't report to the federal government. Also, the we keep saying tile fishing grouper. Uh, the Mid Atlantic Council added blue line tile fish to their golden tile fish plan, but there still is no management plan for grouper north of North Carolina. Correct. So, so right now Virginia's it. But so all this is really you're really requesting is getting rid of the special permit and the rec mandatory reporting, but you're not talking about getting rid of Virginia's grouper regulations, commercial regu uh, and, and recreational landing stuff and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right, so that, that was, I just wanted that clarification. I think everything else is, you know, that's all fine. Further questions? Matters before the commission. Dr. Neal. I'll uh, make a motion to approve staff's request for a public hearing to make these modifications. Second to the motion. Second. Second by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? <coughs> all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Any further business to come before the commission? If not, meeting adjourned. Uh, uh, See, that's why he should be commissioner. Let me turn these in. The chairman Jamie? of the Turn the rivers.